In this video, I'd like to briefly discuss the different styles of conflict management that one might use in a group situation or scenario. So let's start off by defining conflict and, and expressing what we exactly mean by the term conflict. Conflict is an expressed struggle between two interdependent parties involving the perception of incompatible goals, scarce resources, and interference. So let's break that down just a little bit. First of all, conflict is an expressed struggle, meaning that it's something that's out there and known by, by both parties involved, by all parties involved. Uh, if it's not expressed, if it's just something that you're holding inside, then it's not conflict, it's just you being upset about something. And it's not technically conflict. Conflict involves a situation where both people are fully aware that there is a situation that, and that something is, is going on between the two of you. So it's an expressed struggle between interdependent parties. And what we mean by that is by parties who are connected in some way. If you can just walk away, then it's not really conflict. I mean, you may have, you know, a fight or a struggle of some sort, but it's not really conflict in, in the traditional definition because conflict involves interdependent parties. By interdependent, we mean that what happens to one, you know, affects the other person in some way. So it's like ripples on a pond when you throw a, a pebble and you get these ripples, right? So a conflict involves things that are in an in, in interdependent relationship where what happens to one person is going to affect the other as well. Those ripples are going to affect everybody involved. It also involves the perception of these, of one of these things, one or more of these things. So it doesn't even have to actually involve these things. They don't have to actually be present, but if one person or both people perceive that these are in effect, then that can, you know, lead to conflict. So the perception of incompatible goals, scarce resources, or interference, right? So incompatible goals, meaning you're, you, you both want different things, and or scarce resources, meaning there's not enough of something to go around. And interference, meaning you anticipate that, that person is going to try and stop you from achieving your goal and getting what it is that you want out of that situation. So again, it could be that those things are actually in place, or it could just be that you perceive that they are, but either way, they can lead to conflict. So conflict is an expressed struggle between interdependent parties involving the perception of incompatible goals, scarce resources, and interference. So now we're on the same page with what conflict is. Let's talk a little bit about how we manage conflicts, some different conflict management strategies. The first type of conflict management strategy is avoiding. And, you know, this is what we call a lose-lose situation where, you know, both people, one person just kind of walks away and avoids the situation entirely. So people end up not working together at all. Uh, they're just, you know, there's really no resolution there. Um, and it should be only used really in extreme instances where someone's in danger or you feel, you know, feel threatened in that situation. But avoiding really is a lose-lose situation. Nothing comes with both party, both parties lose what it is they want when, when one or both parties decide not to engage. And it can create a really strained situation in a group environment where you're kind of forced to be together. We can also engage in what's called accommodating, where one person gives in to the other, you know. And so, uh, you know, one person just says, kind of, here, here the, I've opened the door for you, here, you go ahead and take it. Now, there are two ways that accommodating, you know, this is what we call a lose-win situation, where one person loses, you, you lose in this instance, and the other person wins. Now, there are two ways that can shake out. One is that you're losing, you're, you're accommodating and you're losing and giving the other person what they want because you are just either the bigger person or that that thing is not really that important to you, not as important as it is to the other person. So you've decided to let them have that or you're just, you know, just, just generously giving of your own free will. That's one thing. Um, but if you, if you're in a situation where you feel like you have to accommodate the other person, you have to give in because they're forcing you to or because they're, you know, you don't feel like you have the power in, in whatever circumstance to, to counteract that person then that can really create a sense of resentment and uh, and, and in the long term be, create even bigger conflict uh, between those two people. So you want to be sure that if you're engaging in accommodating that you're doing so for the right reasons and it's not going to lead to this long-term resentment and, and conflict down the road. In competing, you know, this is what we call uh, win-lose. So, so theoretically you win and the other person loses. Hopefully it turns out that way, not the other way around. But both people go after what they want. There's no accommodating. Both people go after what they want. And then through, again, some sense of power, either could be intellectual power, it could be actual power, it could be physical power, through whatever type of power is used, then one person comes out on top over the other. And so you have one person that's a winner and one person that's a loser after both of them have gone after what they want. Now, the issue here is that even when you win, sometimes you lose in the long run, because in winning, 
if you've burned bridges, if you've hurt that person in some way, if you, you know, if you've lost their respect or lost their uh, companionship or whatever, that could be an issue um, in competing. That it may be, you know, a short-term win, but may have long-term lasting impacts, negative impacts, right? Now, sometimes competing is unavoidable. If there actually are scarce resources, for example, are, are only enough to go around, or not really enough to go around, then you may need to engage in competing. You may not have any choice. If both of you want the same thing, or, you know, then you are going after the same thing. But, but we really need to consider whether those types of situations, if that's the case or not. And if not, then is there another way that we could approach this? And, and is competing really necessary? This next one's kind of gotten a good reputation, but but not really for the right reasons. Um, we, we say compromise. Let's compromise, and that's taken on a positive connotation, right? And, and become kind of a positive thing. But but in the long run, it may not be as positive as we think, because we're really when we when we say compromise in a positive way, most of the time what we're really doing is referring to collaborating, which we'll get to in a minute. But com compromising and collaborating are not the same thing. In compromise, both people give up some of what they want. Right? You can see the me and the you, and then combined is the us, where they're working together. This is what we're compromising on. This is what we're doing. But that still leaves a lot of the me and a lot of the you that are uncovered, right? So so by definition, compromise involves giving up some of what it is you want. So you're getting some of what you wanted, but not all of it, right? Again, that can be okay in the short term, but in the long term, you know, after you get through, you know, what you've actually gotten out of that, you may be thinking to yourself, well, I didn't get everything I wanted, and that could lead to some resentment and things too, and, and you know, lead to further conflict down the road. So compromise can be a short-term solution. It can be a nice band-aid, but it's probably not a cure for whatever conflict you're in. So that's something that needs to be considered as well. Finally, we get to what we call collaborating. And when we say, you know, we have positive conflict management here, this is usually what we're talking about, this positive outcome. Both people work together, and by definition, both parties get all of what they want. When that's possible, that's the best possible outcome, because the long term it's going to work out the best. Again, is it always possible, and is it easy? No, not necessarily. So we need to, to carefully consider when we're engaging in collaborating, but, but when it's an option, it's the best option, because then both people do get all of what they want, and it doesn't leave that lingering resentment over, I didn't get really what I wanted out of this. So which conflict management strategy, which of these is going to be the best? Well, they all have their uses, and they all can be useful in different scenarios, right? Some you're going to probably not use as much, like hopefully avoiding, but uh, and some you're going to use more, like collaborating, hopefully, but but they can all have their uses. So just to show this uh, one little chart here, where they exist on the, the degree of concern for self versus the degree of concern for others, you can see collaborating you know, ranks highly on both of those. It shows both a good degree of concern for yourself, but also a good degree of concern for others, as opposed to, say, competing, which has a higher degree of concern for yourself, but a low degree of concern for others. So we need to you know, identify wh where we're at on this scale and what's going to be important, and certainly what's most important for the group. How is this going to impact the group, not only in terms of achieving their goals, but in, in terms of relational dynamics as well? How is this conflict going to impact the group as a whole? So when we're going to engage in collaboration, there, there are a few steps that need to happen. So I just want to quickly outline those for you. When we talk about conflict management in practice or collaborating in practice, the first thing we need to do is define our needs, figure out for ourselves, what is it that I really need out of this? What is it that I'm hoping for? And what is it that I'm trying to accomplish here? Then we can share our needs with that other person by letting them know, hey, you know, we need to establish a time that we can talk about this too. We don't just want to spring this on the person, you know, in the middle of something else, but establish a time you can talk about it. And then share your needs with that person. Let them know, this is what I need out of this situation. Then once you've had a chance to express yourself and say what you need out of that situation, you also then need to be willing to listen to the other person's needs. Because in collaboration, you're going to both need to get what you want. So it's important for each of you to understand what success looks like for the other person. So once you have a solid grasp on what their needs are, as well as a solid grasp on what your needs are, you can start to generate possible solutions. You can start to talk about, you know, what is it that we can do to, to help ourselves both get what we want out of this? And some of them may be wild, but you write them down. You write them down. You can sort these out later. But So just generate any possible solutions you can to think of where you're both getting what you need. Then you're going to evaluate. You're going to weed some of these out and say, well, that one's not really realistic, and that one doesn't work for me, so let's focus on the ones that, that maybe do. And you're going to pick one. And this, you know, and, and you're going to implement things, right? You're going to start to implement the solution. And this may require some trial and error, though. 
you implement it, you see if it works, and and certainly you're going to follow up on that solution, right? And if it doesn't work, then you go back. You go back to some of those other solutions that you generated, you pick one, and you implement it, and see if you get any better success out of it, right? And you keep doing that until you find what works. Now, again, this can be time-consuming, and it can require a lot of effort and energy, so it doesn't necessarily work for every situation. But when it does, it provides the best long-term resolution to that conflict. And, it's, and it succeeds not only in, in, in terms of what you're, what you're accomplishing specifically with that conflict, but also helps soothe some of the relational uh, dimensions of that uh, conflict in the group. Okay? It helps kind of, kind of serve to, to smooth some of that over as well. So when, when it's necessary, it's the best possible solution. If you have questions about these conflict management strategies or anything else related to small group communication, don't hesitate to email me. I'm always happy to chat via email and answer any questions in, in that way. In the meantime, happy communicating.